Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to my friend Julie Meyer for inviting me to come and speak at Accelerate 2011. Blueprint for big, uh, designing the high growth business. Why is this so important and is now the right time to start a business? I started my first business in 1991. We were in the depths of a recession, but I hardly noticed. I just did it. I made 800 pounds in my first month and with no incentives or government support. So to the second question first, I'd say yes. This firm wasn't big or high growth, mind you. It took me five years to reach half a million in sales and nine employees, but it was successful then and is still going strong today. It makes an important contribution. There's 4.3 million businesses in the UK and a staggering 99.3% of those employ less than 50 people. This means only 30,000 businesses in this country grow beyond that size. The picture with sales growth is just as telling. Below a million in sales, average annual growth rate in sales is 73%. With turnover rising towards 3 million, that growth rate falls to 46%. And beyond 3 million, the growth rate in sales annually falls to a meager 10%. So the message is growth is hard to achieve. Small business plays a vital role in the UK economy and we need more of them, no doubt about that. And there were 362,000 startups last year. But we cannot simply be a nation of shopkeepers anymore. And I was astonished to hear at a recent launch event for Startup Britain earlier this year, someone who should know better talk of the dream of owning your own shop during, this important, during his important keynote. Small business is great, but on its own it's not enough. We need people, to, we need people with bigger dreams. We need to create more high growth businesses with the potential to become big. So using my own journey of building Coffee Nation, I want to share with you some thoughts on designing the high growth business. I believe more needs to be talked about this stuff and I think entrepreneurship in the UK needs to move on from starting up to growing up. Last week I attended the Made Entrepreneur Festival in Sheffield. I was asked to sit on a panel with some other successful entrepreneurs. I was in great company, Paul Lindley of Ellis Kitchen, James Arvidick of Goo, Puddings and Lara Morgan of Pacific Direct. These are all great examples of what I'm talking about. They all have sales of 20 to 30 million pounds and some have been sold for similar amounts of money. Paul had disrupted the status quo of the baby food industry, James had innovated with indulgent desserts and Lara had removed the headache of purchasing toiletries for the world's top hotel groups. Work out what you're going to do and why you're going to succeed. Can you do it better than everyone else or are you going to do something different? An important question, know thyself. Are you one of those unreasonable and unemployable people? What drives you to go that different to that different entrepreneur country every day? I look back at my own childhood and recognize some of the signs. I was a single child and adopted. I had a lot to prove, but as you can see from the photo, I had some powerful influencing techniques and the orange pants were hit with my fellow directors. School didn't do it for me really, and I dropped out of A-levels to get a job and get going. An early boss when I was 19 gave me my big break and believed in me. When I was building Coffee Nation, I had a saying, never doubt for a moment, no matter how uncertain I may feel. If you cannot deal with that uncertainty, then you're not an entrepreneur. I would urge you to save your time and money. But we all start somewhere. I'd seen coffee in convenience stores in New York in the summer of 96, and I thought this could be huge if I could take it back to the UK and replicate it. I started with these tabletop machines dispensing, uh, sorry, whisking up Nescafe coffee granules with powdered milk, calling it a cappuccino and selling it for 49p. The only thing worse than the cappuccinos was my fashion sense and clearly the baseball cap was a big mistake. But there was genius in all of this. I was learning my space and knowing what doesn't work and why is so important. Until you have proof, do not make the mistake of writing business plans and raising money. The business plan will be meaningless because you have no evidence that what you say in it is true. You'll be pulled around by opinionated individuals who most likely will have little to no knowledge of your space. But you will listen and try to please because they have something that you think you need. You may raise some seed capital, but you will be diluted for something that is as yet unproven. I can tell you all this now because I nearly made that same mistake. I did my desk research, talked to suppliers, read up on the trend for eating on the go, and got real interest from convenience store groups all days in spa. In fact, they loved the idea. So I wrote a business plan thinking how smart I was and nearly secured £75,000 from a business angel. Thank God he pulled out. Fortunately, I was learning fast. 
the wise entrepreneur devises low-cost experiments to validate or disprove before it's too late. The clue here is in the title. Most successful startups end up becoming successful doing something very different to what they started out doing. This can be a real sinking feeling when you confront the inevitable, this ain't working. But as they say, the darkest and coldest moments come just before the dawn. My eureka moment that set me on my way was real espresso coffee made from fresh beans and fresh milk for every cup. The MDF unit that, that, we, that we put this coffee machine on swelled up and started to fall apart if you spilt the coffee on it. And the fridge for the milk was a little unreliable, so sometimes you got milk, sometimes you got cheese. <laughs> but heck, it worked. I put the drink price up by 40% and my sales doubled. The Coffee Nation name appeared for the first time also, although my wife thought her suggestion of Climax Coffee was better. I'm not sure whether it would have been such a good idea. But most importantly, uh, now was the right time to raise that seed capital and at a good price. And I raised a, or got a pledge of £100,000 uh, and secured that in one day. And all of that was because I now had the proof that I had a viable business. Sure, of course, we needed to develop the machine and the concession unit and refine lots of other things, but I had enough evidence that there was a viable business here with big potential. Most businesses fail to launch or fail to grow for the simple reason there's insufficient demand for what they're selling. Find a way to prove that you're really onto something. Bootstrap your way forward, spend a little and learn a lot. Remove the most important uncertainties first. The killer risks are often based on unexamined assumptions that underpin your venture. Beat the odds, reduce your risks at every stage and before making significant financial or operational commitments. I had another eureka moment and that was when I realized I'd created a new market category. Self-serve gourmet coffee stations, combining the product quality of a coffee bar with a small footprint convenience and unmanned nature of vending. All our success was down to this single focused statement. If you cannot lead the category in, you're in, then set up a new category you can lead. And if you can do that, you'll make the competition irrelevant. Companies that own their space are often characterized by having high margins and an emotional connection with their consumers who come back again and again and are willing to pay a premium price. They're highly differentiated, they have an unfair advantage and explosive growth potential. Companies that don't are one of the pack. They attend industry dinners and join trade associations. They're often low margin and suffer from downward price pressure at the hands of powerful customers and suppliers. They're cost-driven, stand for nothing, and have limited growth potential. They are not memorable. Which of these businesses sounds like more fun to be leading? We created a third space in the out-of-home coffee market between coffee bars and traditional vending. And probably the single most important point is that we're able to operate in prime high foot traffic locations and so become a mainstream retail category, which clearly vending could not. Slides like this are a dream in investment pitches and business plans, but of course, as long as you have the evidence to back them up. This will be a long and hard path down which you travel. Make it worthwhile. Craft an extremely ambitious global goal and think big. At the start of our rollout, my chairman and I visited our, our first machine. At the top, it said Europe's leading, Europe's, mind you, leading self-serve gourmet coffee. You can't say that, he said. We only have one machine. <laughs> yeah, I know, I said, but that's my vision. And besides, our nearest competitor has none. <laughs> I was creating my own reality. My vision was that smart urban gourmet coffee stations would become a way of life in 21st century Britain. Think and act big. Visionary companies display a remarkable resilience and tend to bounce back from adversity. They often achieve extraordinary long-term performance. So how did we do? I dug this out the other day, actually. I wrote this uh, before we raised our private equity funding. Some of it, when you read it, is clearly rather naive. Um, but we wrapped up the key players in our markets, as we said there. But it took seven years to get 600 sites, uh, not the three years that I put there to 1,000. The consumer did identify with us. We, develop, we did develop touchscreen drink selection, and it was a fun place to work. A stock market listing and being pan-European within five years were perhaps a little ambitious. Building a high-growth company is not for the faint-hearted, and I found it invaluable having someone alongside me on the journey who'd been there and done it before. 
When we met, Derek was impressed by me because I was passionate about my product, I had a real vision and could sell myself. I was impressed by him because he asked difficult questions and he had experience of building all the way to a successful exit. He became chairman in 1999 and remained so until we sold the business in 2008. We spoke more than once a week, sometimes in fact spoke very, every day. And he was a terrific sounding board, an event for my frustrations and difficult times. This was an article from the, uh, from the FT a few years ago. A business is a lot like chess or football. Line up the pieces or the players in the right way to achieve your goals. These five points, plus a strong and proven management team, are all that any professional investor, VC or private equity house the world over wants to see. If you can genuinely put a tick against all these, then you truly have the goods and nothing to fear, and you will be in demand. Gourmet coffee and coffee bars were growing fast. Anyone could see we were in a growth market. We were first into our space. We wrapped up long-term contracts with prestigious corporates from day one, and our capital-intensive business model made it difficult for others to compete with us. And we maintained that market leadership over a 10-year period. We perceive the market to be almost anywhere, bookstores, airports, train stations, bowling alleys. I'm not sure what made me think people would drink coffee instead of beer in a bowling alley, but there you go. It wasn't a trial that lasted very long. We hit a home run with petrol forecourts and motorway service areas. Our operating model enabled us to scale up. And finally, trends build long-term success. Premium quality out of home, on the move food and drink was growing fast and we could become part of it. One of the benefits for me of having an experienced chairman and a private equity investor from early on were the disciplines of having a board. It amazes me how many entrepreneurs actually hold back their businesses through fear of recruiting people smarter than they are or think that the rigor of a monthly board meeting is a waste of time. I remember ver very early on my new chairman asking one of our angel investors, do you think Martin will make a good CEO? He replied honestly, we'll see. I remember thinking, hang on a minute, you can't ask that question, this is my company. But, for many, the transition from the micromanaging, passionate entrepreneur to the professional and objective CEO can be a difficult one, but a bridge you need to cross if you are to remain leader of the business you founded, after you've brought in external professional investors. The other role often poorly addressed is that of the finance function. If you are serious about high growth, you will need an experienced finance director not a bookkeeper or financial controller. Recruit for this position as soon as you can afford them or even before. Good FDs act like navigators on the bridge of a ship, guiding the captain past the perilous icebergs and safely to destination. We had remuneration and audit committees from the get-go and these disciplines paid dividends when it came to exit. There's a lovely question that uh, was asked of a successful entrepreneur that I read about um, quite recently. How do you make a big company? The answer was you don't. You make a small company, you m use the profits to hire good people, and they make the big company for you. That's so true. So back to our machines. I think we're on to plan C by now. On the left, this was the first uh, handmade glass fibre unit. It was a work of art. It was made in a little factory in Stockport. It cost £20,000. If we'd rolled out with this, I think we'd have been bust quite quickly. On the right-hand side was the initial 1.5 metre wide uh, unit we rolled out with. It was a metre and a half wide to give maximum in-store presence. In the end, a standard one metre linear uh, bay uh, was sufficient. And these pictures show uh, what was the mainstay of our expansion. And by, by the time we sold the business, we had nearly 600 of these around the UK. Now, to give you an impression of just how much, how much revenue we could generate out of these, the two, the two machines on the left are in a welcome break motorway service area uh, in a retail shop there. And they were generating over a thousand pounds a day uh, from just that two, that two linear meter bay. Uh, each machine was linked back to base so we could see, <coughs> by the internet, so we could see how many drinks had been sold, how many had uh, been dispensed, sorry. And was it low on beans, was it low on milk? Uh, and even if it had been cleaned to the set, the set schedule. The other is in a Tesco Express convenience store and we eventually operated in, in 160 of those. I mentioned earlier that I owned the kit and split the revenue with the shop. We could not have succeeded without creating a disruptive business model. Traditional vending machine businesses were all about machine rental payments or free machine and then you pay for the ingredients. Neither of these models focused on the sale of a cup of coffee and this was a serious limitation. 
I wanted to make self-serve gourmet coffee a mainstream retail category, so it needed a new business model. We own the equipment and split the revenue generated. Because we own the assets, we, not the retailer, controlled our drink price, and we were able to secure long-term exclusive contracts with each company. We removed the risk for them. They could outsource the whole coffee business to us with confidence. We maintained the equipment, and we trained the store staff to clean and replenish them daily. They knew if we didn't maintain them, sales would decline, and we'd lose. And we knew if they didn't uh, clean the machine, sales would decline, and they'd lose. And that created a powerful win-win relationship. I've used a picture of our product here, which of course is what it's all about. The quote is from one of our corporate customers during the due diligence when we were exiting. A nice, nice quote, obviously. My benchmark was that our quality had to be equivalent to a high street coffee bar and with identical re reliability. You wouldn't expect to visit Starbucks to be told, sorry, the machine's out of order. We averaged 99.7% trading availability over my years as eight, eight years as CEO. And in many locations, we were the highest selling product with the highest sales and profit densities per square foot of any product category. Another quote from our due diligence exercise was, unique offer, they're cornering the market, no one is fighting back. Part of that success came from really knowing our space. We had an insatiable appetite for data. This graph is taken from work we did with Tesco Club Card, which showed that the level of repeat purchase and increase in frequency of purchase of Coffee Nation Tesco was unusually high for new products in their stores. We were able to prove that we were driving customers into their locations who knew then would, of course, buy other products. And finally, we won plenty of awards and had lots of press coverage. This picture was taken at the Orange Small is Beautiful Awards back in 2003. It was our first award win. It was for entrepreneurial passion, and we all got very drunk. <laughs> I also consider myself fortunate that for most of the time building our company was fun, which is how I think it should be. My real point here, though, is about our people. Because we had a clear vision of where we were going and we were excited about it, people wanted to join the company. They joined us not for a pay rise. In fact, some actually took a pay cut to join. But because they could see Coffee Nation was a genuine meritocracy led by passionate people and had an exciting future. Being part of something like that is really the biggest motivator to get out of bed on a Monday morning for most people. And finally, never ever give up. Thank you. <laughs>